I am Joel Fishman, president of the Public Diplomacy Association of America. In pre-pandemic days, this is a time we would be meeting at Decor Bacon House, greeting old and new friends and enjoying lunch with our guests. We miss those days and look forward to their return. Fortunately, thanks to our partnership, thanks to the partnership between PDAA, the Public Diplomacy Council, and the USC Annenberg Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, we are able to reach out to you through this webinar and welcome, welcome you to this program with Radio Free Asia Director, Bei Fang. Our tech host today is Judy Kang. If you are experiencing a problem at any time during the program, please address it to Judy. That's Judy Kang, K-A-N-G, in the chat box. It is now my privilege to turn the program over to Ambassador Greta Morris, who will introduce our speaker and moderate the program. Greta is co-chair of the joint PDAA-PDC program committee. Over to you, Greta. Okay, well, thank you so much, Joel. Thank you to everyone who is um, attending uh, today. And um, uh, thank you especially to our speaker, um, Bei Fong, the president of, of Radio Free Asia, whom I actually met uh, a couple of years ago at a real PDAA luncheon at uh, Dakor House. And I have wanted to invite her for one of our programs ever since. So, so it's a thrill to have you. Um, you've all seen her very distinguished background. Um, <clears throat> she was a um, Beijing bureau chief for US News and World Report. She's covered the the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary for, public, uh, for Press and Public Diplomacy during the Obama administration. Uh, <clears throat> and um, all this before becoming the president of Radio Free Asia. And her uh, academic background is equally distinguished. She has a BA from, from Harvard. She was a, um, a visiting fellow at Oxford uh, a Fulbright Scholar in Hong Kong, and for something completely different, she trained as a French chef at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris. And that'll be a subject for another program. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, Bay is going to begin um, with an introduction to um, Radio Free Asia, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and then that will be uh, followed by a a dialogue um, that um, that uh, that I will lead, but but Bay will will be the 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 principal speaker, uh, and then we'll open the discussion to to your questions. But um, uh, if you want to ask a question, please um, please uh, 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 use the raise hand function. Um, I think that's under participants. Is that correct, Judy? Or uh, you can click on the reactions box and you're gonna find the blue uh, hand okay. that, um, that says raise hand. Okay, great. And then, uh, then um, either Judy or I will recognize you and, uh, and you can go ahead and, and ask your question. So um, uh, Bay, let me turn this program over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me here, Greta. It's really a pleasure. And I see a lot of friends in the audience, so I'm excited about that. Um, I know many of you are very familiar with RFA, but I thought I'd start with just a quick introduction to um, you know, our origins, how we came to be, what our mission is. Um, and then move into uh, Q&A with Greta and, uh, and tell a little bit about, about specifics about our reporting. Um, so by way of quick intro, uh, we were created by Congress in the wake of the Tiananmen massacre. Um, and it was actually uh, then Senator Joe Biden who championed our creation, who insisted on the need for an Asian um, uh, analog to Radio Free Europe um, that was totally independent from the US government. Um, so the idea was that we were supporting the foreign policy objectives of the US government, not by propagandizing to these foreign audiences about US policies, but rather to support 
the spread of intrinsic democratic values that the U.S. stands for, um, and uh, and uh, doing that by giving the 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 citizens of countries that don't have free and open press, like China, like North Korea, like Myanmar. Um, access to the truth of what's happening in their own countries. So following the principle that an educated citizenry is beneficial to democracy. Um, and this is known as, as surrogate broadcasting. It's what uh, Radio Free Europe was already doing um, uh, um, at that point um, to, uh, to people behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and we were uh, uh, mandated to do to countries in Europe. So we actually uh, in this September actually marks our the 25th anniversary of our first broadcast, which was in Mandarin um, uh, and into China uh, uh, by shortwave radio. Um, so since then, we've we've uh, expanded to four language services uh, broadcasting into China and anywhere else who who uh, you know can receive it. Uh, so that's Mandarin, Cantonese, Tibetan, and Uyghur. It's the, the only uh, Uyghur uh, service in the world. Um, four into Southeast Asia. That's. Uh, Burmese, um, Khmer into Cambodia, Laotian and Vietnamese, um, and then lastly Korean, uh, focused on on audiences in North Korea. Um, we also have a digital only brand, Binar News, which uh, broadcasts to uh, audiences in Southeast Asia, um, and was was sort of started to counter the the message of uh, violent extremists. Um, and so we're we're uh, we're a private nonprofit that is funded by an annual grant um, uh, from Congress through the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Uh, and the way we get into these audiences, um, into these countries, is country specific. So we still do use shortwave in many places, but uh, you know, obviously, we also broadcast uh, in, uh, on FM, AM, uh, through satellite, and reach audiences digitally and through social media platforms. Uh, so, for example, in in North Korea, which is our most closed country, um, we you know our, our our main audiences still reach us through shortwave. Um, we recently started meeting way from Seoul, uh, but still our most active audience is, you know, as you can imagine, uh, in the middle of the night um, uh, from North Korea. Um, whereas in Southeast Asia um, and, you know, in Cambodia, even though, uh, you know, we're kicked out of the country in 2017, we're actually the second most popular uh, uh, Facebook account. Um, you know, we have, we have the most uh, followers. Um, so, uh, I know you guys might be interested in in um, our audience numbers. Um, that's that's always a question I get, um, and it is hard to estimate. Um, I can give you guys a, a rough estimate. Um, uh, you know, in in China, uh, you know, the most recent survey that uh, that was done through USAGM, uh, we had about forty four million, um, uh, you know, weekly uh, uh, um, viewers. Um, but it's so difficult to conduct surveys in many of our target countries. So. So, um, uh, you know, you can't just turn up uh, and, and do a survey in North Korea, but, uh, but in some of our most uh, difficult countries, um, we've done um, surveys that, that we, uh, you know, they are not representative. We can't call them representative because their surveys, uh, for example, of, of North Koreans, um, uh, defectors and uh, travelers and refugees in China and South Korea, but almost uniformly, 20% of those people had uh, said they had listened to RFA when they were in um, in their home countries. Uh, and then a survey of Uyghur refugees in Turkey showed that 31% had listened to us um, while while in their country. So uh, that's just uh, you know an estimate of uh, of our audiences. Um, so I'll I'll stop there and let Greta uh, you know ask some questions, and I can tell you about uh, our coverage in China and. Um, uh, Hong Kong uh, um, and wherever else you're interested in. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, that great introduction, Bay. I, I gather from your introduction that that RFA does not have a television service. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But more importantly, um, uh, and I was interested, you said that um, that Radio Free Asia was was started um, at the time of the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre, and uh, so really a, a truly a, a, a crisis point in in China and and in Asia, and I think RFA has continued to really be at the forefront 
of um, broadcasting to and about these these hot spots in Asia and um, the most important the most important issues and and I think it could be argued that our relationship right now with Asia is uh, the United States's relationship with Asia is one of our most critical right now. Um, certainly, the relationship with with China and the the issue of, of uh, Taiwan, which is just, um, uh, you know, one that could that could could light a fire in 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 the world at, at any moment, uh, and then of course we have Burma, which uh, uh, recently had a coup. But even before that, the the treatment of the Rohingya population has been a has been a terrible um, ongoing issue, and I know. Uh, Radio Free Asia has 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 covered that extensively, uh, and then of course the uh, the the situation with China. China's growing economic, political, and military might. Its its repression of the democracy movement in Hong Kong, and of now the Uyghur issue, which uh, of course many have called genocide. Um, but just a terrible treatment of the Uyghur Muslim population in Xinjiang um, province. So um, I'm wondering if you could just talk a bit about your coverage of those issues. I understand that you, you do, do have a slide presentation that will help you do that. So please go ahead and, and use the slide presentation if you'd like to do that. Sure thing, I will. Um, let me see. Okay. Okay. Can you all see this? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I wanted to go into a few highlights of our reporting. So it is interesting, as you say, Greta, it is often in crisis moments that I think the, um, you know, the, the need for something like RFA uh, becomes uh, eminently clear. So, for example, at the beginning of the coronavirus um, outbreak in, in China, we actually saw our, uh, our Facebook views go up, the video views go up almost 900% just in the, in the couple of months after, uh, um, in January and February of, of 2020. So, uh, just after Wuhan went into lockdown, um, people, um, you know, mainly from inside China, were just looking for sources of of truth uh, uh, about what was going on around them. Um, so one story uh, that uh, that got a lot of attention was basically. Um, uh, looking at how many people actually died in Wuhan uh, in January and February during that two month lockdown. So the official number was um, 2,800, uh, but our Mandarin reporters, I mean, this is basic like shoe leather reporting. Um, they called the seven main uh, funeral parlors in, in Wuhan. They had people saying, well, you know, the incinerators are, are working around the clock. They found out that, that uh, these funeral parlors were, sorry, this is a little bit graphic, but they were returning the cremated remains of 500 people a day to, to families, each of the, the funeral parlors. Um, and uh, they cross-checked this with sources from the provincial government, and they came up with the, this estimate of 46,000, um, which you know is, is a whole order of magnitude uh, difference. Um, so this actually informed the reporting um, in, uh, in many um, uh, uh, outlets. Um, we were... Uh, um, it, so we, we, we basically um, reported on uh, what was happening in China and then, um, and, then, uh, and then also followed up on that with their uh, reporting on their disinformation campaign. Um, so um, at one point, uh, China was, uh, was, you know, sort of used uh, fake Twitter accounts to, uh, to spread mass disinformation about, um, you know, how they had handled uh, the COVID outbreak. They blamed the initial um, uh, um, uh, outbreak of, of cases on visitors from the US military who had come to Wuhan. Um, and in, uh, there was actually a ProPublica story about uh, these, these sort of fake Twitter handles that the Chinese government had started. And one of them was actually, uh, uh, one of these handles was, uh, you know, sort of basically, basically cloned the uh, RFA logo, uh, called themselves Radio Free Northeast in, in Mandarin, um, and was touting China's assistance to Italy. So, you know, it, it's actually kind of a measure 
measure of our impact that uh, that you know we were used by the Chinese government to uh, to claim legitimacy. Um, in Hong Kong, we uh, have been we're one of the few independent outlets that's still broadcasting in in Mandarin and Cantonese um, on the streets. We've been there since the beginning, uh, live streaming protests. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely worried about being shut down, but, uh, but it's, um, you know, we're, we're sort of one of the few that, that, um, is still, uh, you know, reporting freely. Um, we, uh, uh, we, um, had, we broke the story about the 12 activists that, uh, fled by speedboat to seek asylum in Taiwan, who were then intercepted by the Guangdong Coast Guard, um, and have since been, uh, been put in jail. Um, we uh, and uh, and so you know we've we've been there. This is um, an image of uh, we have a, a resident um, artist, uh, a cartoonist, Rebel Pepper, um, whose work has actually been uh, featured on the walls in Hong Kong. People have been um, sharing his images, um, uh, and um, uh, these are just a few of of the images that uh, that we've captured. Um, and we, we try to look not only at the sort of, uh, you know, the stories that everyone else is telling, um, we, uh, we actually have a, a new, um, uh, um, brand uh, called Why Not uh, in, in English and, and in Chinese it's called Why Now, which is kind of like giving you a different perspective. Uh, literally, it means kind of like slanted brain. So it's giving you a different perspective on the world. And the idea uh, behind that is to, um, to target the sort of post Tiananmen generation, you know, people who, uh, you know, grew up, uh, you know, not necessarily knowing what, what Tiananmen was actually, you know, uh, one of our producers uh, who works for uh, Why Not actually um, didn't even know about Tiananmen until she came here as a student. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, one of the, uh, the series that, that we did, we did a five part series that looks at the 100 days after the uh, China's national security law was passed. So how that law has upended daily life, not just for, you know, activists and journalists, but for, you know, sort of the regular 7 million people who are living in that former colony. So uh, parents, educators, um, you know, artists, financiers, um, that kind of thing. Um, our reporting in Xinjiang has actually uh, uh, been, um, uh, you know, widely touted. Um, we were actually the ones who uh, were the first to inform the world about this detention of, of millions of Uyghurs in, in vast internment camps um, in, in, uh, in Western China and, and the buildup of a high-tech security state in Xinjiang. Um, the, uh, um, the, the US administration has called it a genocide um, and we've made it, you know, with our, uh, you know, sort of relentless reporting, I think we've made it increasingly difficult for China's leaders to deny that this is happening. Um, and a lot of people ask about um, how we do this, uh, this kind of reporting. Um, this is just a, an article from The Economist that, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, someone I know who, uh, you know, later on, uh, who was an editor there said, you know, this is the first time he's actually seen The Economist advocate for uh, more funding for another media organization, um, which, which they did in this, in this article. Um, but, uh, but basically, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, again, it's, it's just shoe leather reporting. I mean, so this, uh, this uh, reporter show, Rhett Hosher, um, one of our star reporters in the Uyghur service, um, you know, he makes uh, upwards of 100 phone calls a day to local police stations in Xinjiang. Um, uh, sometimes he uses uh, voice distortion now that, that uh, uh, the Chinese have voice recognition software. Um, but, uh, um, but, you know, so one story he broke was about this five-year-old whose uh, parents had been detained in a, in a detention camp and was being watched by grandparents and he uh, was found frozen to death in, in a snowbank. Um, and he he basically, and he, he found out that there was this, uh, um, the spate of uh, deaths of, uh, you know, infant and toddler children across Xinjiang. And the, the reason he found the story was because he just noticed that there was, you know, this 
you know, public service announcement uh, on, on Chinese state media in Uyghur um, talking about the importance of keeping children safe. And so he was like, you know, what's this about? So he started calling around and he found out that there were all of these kids whose parents had been detained, who um, were, uh, um, you know, being watched by people or not being watched and, uh, and um, uh, you know, and, and so um, it, it's it's one of these um, stories that really goes to the societal impact um, of of what's been happening. And you know, he he just found it by, um, you know, by by uh, following up on on a, a tip. Um, and then lastly, I'll you know, I, I know we'll talk about this more later, but uh, um, for our reporting in uh, in Myanmar. Um, we uh, we were actually the first to, to um, confirm Aung San Suu Kyi's arrest um, uh, through an interview with, with her party spokesperson. Um, within the first two weeks of the coup, uh, we actually, um, the Burmese service exceeded half a billion video views on Facebook. Um, but we continued uh, holding the military regime to account um, by covering its first press conference. And uh, I, I Man, who's our uh, Napida bureau chief, uh, pressed the spokesperson for answers um, about the coup's legality, about their use of force, um, and uh, um, and they, you know they posted the segment on Facebook. It was viewed more than uh, uh, five million times uh, that day. So um, so that speaks to the importance of being nimble, also in in uh, our use of, of different. Um, a platform. So, um, as you know, uh, you know the military has been cutting internet access uh, in in intermittently in in Myanmar, um, and uh, and so you know we it's important that we uh, you know are still able to broadcast through shortwave, where a lot of people um, still still reach us. Um, we are actually, um, this sort of speaks to the, the widespread influence of China, but we're not allowed on transmitters that are based in Thailand and the Philippines that VOA broadcasts from um, because they, uh, you know, um, because of the, the Chinese influence um, and, uh, you know, the, the feeling that um, they don't want RFA's uh, news reaching, um, reaching people. Um, so that is a key obstacle to RFA reaching a wider audience, which is why, um, you know, people People choose to reach us on Facebook nowadays, um, but uh, but it, you know it speaks to to the importance of having uh, these these different um, uh, media through which we we reach our audience. Um, so uh, you had asked about the Rohingya story. We're also one of the few media outlets that have people in Rakhine State, and they're still there um, despite everything that's been going on. Um, and then we also our, our sister agency, uh, Benar News. Um, uh, actually reports from the Bangladesh side. So we have people in Cox's Bazaar. So we reported extensively, for example, on the, the fire um, uh, it, that happened um, uh, in March and, um, and used satellite imagery to, to show the impact of, of that and how it displaced 45,000 people. So, uh, so that's just a, a, a taste of our reporting. Yeah, well, thank you, Bay, and a really very, very interesting, and um, of course, extremely impressive. And it, it just shows how how um, important these kinds of of um, free um, media services are, uh, and um, uh, just covering all of these most uh, important and, and critical issues. But I want to turn to, um, and we can of course come back to this. Um, but I want to, uh, to turn just for a, um, a few minutes to um, some of the internal issues with the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which I know has been going through um, certainly a, a period of, of turmoil during the last, uh, well, um, for, for, for much of the, of the Trump, um, uh, the President Trump uh, administration, but um, uh, particularly in the last um, in the last few months, um, and I know that you uh, you experienced some of that that turmoil yourself. But but I'm just wondering if you could give us some insights into that. But then also, um, what has happened subsequently uh, to that to uh, with the, the new Biden administration uh, and specifically. Have uh, has the firewall 
been um, been restored and uh, are you able to report freely now without any attempted um, interference? Yeah, uh, that's a very important question. Thank you for asking it. Um, yeah, I mean, the firewall is is key to our mission. I mean, as, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, you know, we're we're not a, a political uh, arm at all, um, and uh, and the way we maintain credibility with our audience is uh, is by um, being seen as politically independent. Um, I think we would lose a lot of audience if they believed that we were just, um, you know, spouting. Uh, um, you know, propaganda from from whatever administration is is in power. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think was so damaging uh, during uh, Michael Pack's tenure was um, was this uh, idea that um, you know he was dismantling the firewall and uh, and um, you know that the um, these entities were were uh, thought of being used uh, as um, uh, you know, as as uh, you know, sort of spouting uh, the the propaganda of a particular administration. I mean, that's exactly what um, authoritarian countries, um, you know, like China or Russia would would uh, would like to be able to say about Radio Free Asia or Radio Free Europe that that you know we're we're just a uh, um, uh, political you know that we're we're basically just like their own state media. Um, so the firewall has, uh, it, so when you say it, it's definitely been restored in, in principle. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, um, it's very important. One of the things that I told the, um, the transition team when, uh, you know, before the Biden presidency came, came in, um, was that, you know, so our reporting should not be influenced at all. If, if president Biden were to, um, for example, go on a trip to, uh, uh, to Vietnam and decide to, you know, um, uh, you know, warm relations with with the Vietnamese government. Uh, um, that should not affect our reporting. Um, that you know is is heavy hitting against you know the Vietnamese government's uh, corruption or land grabs or whatever. Um, uh, that should not be influenced uh, in one bit. Uh, so. Um, uh, so uh, you know, I believe that that is uh, you know the case that they um, they would not interfere with with our reporting. Um, uh, you know, so so the firewall itself is uh, you know instituted in both statute and uh, in regulation. So um, so it uh, you know uh, so PAC actually got rid of the uh, the. Um, uh, the regulation um, uh, and it, it has to be restored through a number of, uh, of uh, uh, measures, but, um, but in practice, it has definitely been restored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, that's very, very good to hear. Um, and I know that uh, US AGM has an acting um, director now, um, uh, Kaylee Chow, but is, um, uh, do you know if there are plans to to um, either make her the full director or to uh, nominate someone else as as the director of of USAGM. Uh, I don't know what the plans are for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, thank you so much. And I think now maybe it's a time that we open this up to um, uh, to questions from our audience. Just wanted to ask you a question about disinformation. You know, everyone who's working in international media and concerned about the future of democracy in various regions of the world is completely seized with this issue. In, in my organization, IREX, we are, but we're one of many. Um, I'm just wondering in your position, you know, how are you thinking about dealing with disinformation? Are you doing any targeted programming uh, now or do you plan anything in the future? I just love your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, so uh, um, I feel like all of our reporting is targeting disinformation. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think by our very existence, um, and um, you know, I think that's that's why it's important to actually expand uh, what we're doing. Um, for example, with this uh, Why Not initiative, that's uh, trying to reach younger audiences and and kind of expanding their worldview. Um, 
you know, when we were created, uh, China was not the, the media juggernaut that it is now. It wasn't spending upwards of a billion dollars a year on trying to influence media, not just in its own country, but in others, and to spread this authoritarian, um, uh, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, their, their uh, authoritarian view of, um, of, of governance. Um, and uh, and so I think it's it's uh, they've also you know there there wasn't the uh, the ability um, through social media to um, uh, to influence um, in the way that that there is now. Um, so we've made sure that we're on all different uh, platforms. Um, uh, with why not, for example, we um, you know we're not able to create uh, um, an account on on WeChat, but we make it really easy um, on our app or on the website to um, to share um, things that uh, that that people see. Um, they can share it as. A uh, a, 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 they make it into a JPEG so that it's harder to censor and they can, you know, post it on their own social media account. Um, and, uh, and, you know, basically the, the word of mouth is spread that way. We, we've actually started the, um, the first uh, Mandarin uh, animated political satire. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, kind of um, the idea is like the incredible so it's about a family um, with superpowers they live on a, a corporate campus um, of uh, Lehigh Corporation those of you who speak Mandarin will understand the significance of that but um, but you know this has already gone viral and we actually haven't even done a hard launch of this product yet uh, because you know I think uh, people were, were waiting until after uh, Michael Pack's tenure so we, we were planning on doing that um, this year. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like um, all of this, you know, in in different ways, um, and and without actually kind of pounding, um, uh, you know, on the the you know without so our you know our, in in the past our bread and butter was you know kind of looking at the human rights issues, um, uh, you know, uh, interviewing activists, giving them a platform. Um, that's changed because China's changed because these other countries have changed. Um, you know, we now want to also address um, you know issues that people are just seeing around them and and you know raise some questions like um, you know the economy. Um, so uh, you know we we did a, a series. Um, uh, called the Gray Rhino series. So basically looking at, uh, you know, what's going on with China's economy, what the weaknesses are, and uh, basically just giving people a view um, into what's happening around them. Um, same with like LGBT issues. Um, you know, why is, uh, why is it uh, um, still, you know, a, a taboo topic in many places. What is, uh, you know, what are, uh, what's going on with, um, with the communities um, in different parts of China, um, that kind of thing. So I think all of that actually pushes back at Chinese disinformation. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's see, uh, Judy, I still can't see the raised hands, but well, I see an actual raised pencil from, um, Michael Anderson. So Michael, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I have two quick questions. One is on, uh, could you just clarify briefly, are there countries or areas where accredited RFA journalists are not allowed in? And then two on the messaging issue, uh, the Trump administration focused their China messaging on anti-communist party, not the Chinese people. In your coverage of China, do you focus on official Chinese government action or do you try to reflect broad what's happening in China beyond the communist party? Thank you. Sure. So, um, so yeah, we, uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're actually uh, we've widened our um, our reporting over the years. So we do try to um, uh, talk about uh, you know sort of uh, things that that people see in, in in their regular lives that they might be interested in the environment, um, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not just about the the 
the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, we are not allowed in in most of the countries that that we report on. We have uh, we ha we we are not allowed in China. Um, uh, we uh, we have bureaus in Hong Kong and in Taipei, um, uh, in Seoul, uh, and then in Southeast Asia. We we have bureaus um, around Myanmar that we are um, you know now uh, having to to. Uh, sort of think about. Um, we have a lot of reporters in hiding right now. Um, uh, we were kicked out of Phnom Penh. We had a, a, um, a bureau there. Uh, we were kicked out in 2017 by Hun Sen. Um, we still have uh, uh, two former reporters who um, uh, are facing charges there that have not been dropped. Um, and uh, um, you know, they're, they're basically sort of uh, trumped up um, charges that uh, um, you know, that, that are totally bogus, that basically are just uh, targeting them for, for having worked for, for Radio Free Asia and for trying to sort of expose the truth. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're actually, uh, you know, not allowed in, in most of the countries, which, you know, is a measure of our impact. I mean, I think it, um, it shows that the, the governments actually fear what we're reporting um, that they don't want to give us access. Um, so, for example, like I like I mentioned before, um, with our uh, Uyghur reporters, you know, they're they're based in DC. Um, they're you know calling in the you know the middle of the night our time often to uh, to do their reporting, um, but they have you know amazing contacts there, um, and they know how to speak to people, and they um, uh, have that authenticity that I think is is really important. Um, we we have to be creative in many ways to uh, to find stories. Um, you know, I'd like to do more investigative reporting, but for example, um, uh, you know, uh, figuring out how to do reporting on North. North Korea um, from the outside. Um, we did um, an investigative series uh, basically following the money. So looking at sources of hard currency for the North Korean regime. Um, we broke these stories about uh, North Korean workers who were sent all over uh, the world um, to do things like build the, the World Cup soccer stadium in, uh, in Qatar um, to open, you know, doctors who, who opened these clinics in, uh, in Tanzania. Um, and they were all, they're basically like indentured servants, they were sending all of the money that they made back to the regime. Um, so they were an important source of hard currency um, for a regime that was facing sanctions. Mm -hmm. Do you do you use any um, uh, stringers in these countries? Um, or are they just the, the your reporters in Washington just call the the um, uh, their contacts in the in the various countries? Yeah. Um, uh, I can't really speak to, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's mainly, um, uh, reporters here, but then in, in our, uh, in our bureaus as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so some of the, the people in, um, in, uh, Myanmar, for example, are stringers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And now I see that Matthew Wallen has his hand up. So Matthew, and then after Matthew, um, Mary works. Thanks, Greta. Uh, Bay, I think you so, touched on some of what's in my question here. When you're talking about sort of your measures of impact, and you could show like the specific example of people reusing your cartoons and say various graffiti around around Hong Kong and that type of thing. But I'm wondering if you can speak um, a little more pointedly in the ways that you're looking at impact um, and measuring whether or not you're having an effect on what people are thinking or what they are doing in response to your reporting. Uh, that is to your audience directly. Uh, specifically in a way that perhaps you can measure quantitatively other mm -hmm. than like uh, viewership or listenership metric. I mean, what are they actually doing in response? Right, right. So this is always um, difficult uh, in, in, um, in countries uh, that are so closed that we broadcast into. Um, it's a good question. And I think USAGM is always grappling with that. Um, so we do have um, an impact model that, that basically um, takes into account, um, uh, um, you know, some just anecdotal stories, like things that we get um, from audience engagement, especially on social media now. I mean, you know, like you can see with uh, with um, you know our our reporting uh, in, in Myanmar, you know, we got. Um, 
you know, thousands of people saying like, you know, thank you for your reporting on that, uh, on the, uh, um, uh, the first, uh, you know, military press conference, you know, thank you for the brave questions, you know, go sister, that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, we, we also have, um, you know, sort of specific impact stories like, um, you know, especially in Southeast Asia, we have, uh, you know, governments actually responding um, uh, because of, of things that we, uh, you know, have reported on. So, for example, in in Laos, um, you know, we report on um, you know land grabs in in you know a, a particular area, and um, and because of our reporting, because we um, you know sometimes we're getting citizen video that we have to verify and then we'll put out. Um, but it's actually you know it's it's uh, a way for them to to uh, show the world what's happening, um, and uh, and we've had. Uh, um, you know, the government react to that because they see that it's actually getting more attention. Um, but it is, you know, it, it is uh, a combination of, you know, sort of uh, anecdotal evidence like that and, um, and, you know, sort of trying to quantify through, through surveys and, and, and the like. If I can follow up for, for clarification, when you say the governments are reacting, are you actually seeing governments react in a positive way to address yes. the issue? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's what I mean. I mean, it doesn't always happen that way, obviously, but uh, but yeah, we, we definitely have uh, many impact stories, um, uh, you know, um, based on our reporting. That's encouraging. Uh, okay, um, uh, Mary Wirtz. Um, hi, thanks so much for your um, remarks this afternoon. My name is Mary Wirtz and I'm affiliated with the Public Diplomacy Council. And um, my question is about the role that um, US allies in East Asia play in the work of Radio Free Asia. Um, I'm specifically thinking of the North Korean example and how in 2020 South Korea um, passed some pretty controversial laws limiting the spread of information from South Korea into North Korea, such as mm -hmm. through leaflets and things like that. And so more broadly, I'm wondering just what role, you know, with that as an example, what role do partner countries um, play in Radio Free Asia's work? And how do you anticipate that changing as China seeks to gradually expand its soft power influence in the region? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, the, the change of administration in South Korea definitely had a, an impact on um, on our um, ability to to reach uh, North Korea, we actually, um, uh, you know, had thought about doing um, uh, sort of more widespread um, uh, kind of video uh, transmissions, um, and and that's uh, that's uh, definitely made more difficult. Um, so I think, um, you know, and as I uh, mentioned, the um, uh, the example of uh, you know. Uh, Thailand and the Philippines limiting um, our transmissions into Myanmar um, because of the influence of China. Um, you know, it's it's definitely uh, uh, made it difficult as well. Um, so uh, yeah, so those are are some of the examples. Um, uh, you know, we definitely have to be um, uh, you know aware and responsive to um, uh, to political um, interests in in the the areas around the region. Okay, thank you. Let's see, I, I think uh, Catherine Brown has a question. Yes, um, hi Greta, thank you. And hi Bay. it's great to hi. see you and great to see you um, back in this position. I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about your colleagues at Radio Free Asia and the journalists, who are they? Mm. And knowing that they take enormous risk, you know, what kind of protections are, are there for them and what might the public diplomacy community and Congress, what should we be thinking about and making sure that they can do their incredible work? Thanks so much for the question and, uh, and it's great to see you as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, they are, uh, they're from all different backgrounds. Um, so, um, you know, many of them uh, came originally from an activist background. So, um, you know, uh, over the years, um, so for example, um, our Uyghur reporters, um, some of them did have activist uh, uh, backgrounds and we we trained them in journalism. Um, you know, some of the things that, that uh, you know, we've, we've had to, you know, since, since we adhere to the highest journalistic principles, we've had to, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, for example, we're not 
you know, they're, they're not using uh, the word martyr, which they, uh, they may have done um, uh, more instinctively in the past. Um, so, uh, so things like that. But, um, but we're, we're, you know, it, it's, it's really, um, they're really all um, so courageous. I mean, you know, the way that some of these uh, countries have, um, have tried to limit our reporting. Um, so, you know, China, um, in the, in the early days when they were detaining um, uh, Uyghur um, uh, residents of Xinjiang, um, they targeted the family members of our, uh, of our reporters. And um, so six of them still have uh, family members that are, that are detained. And the, uh, the officials actually said specifically that they were being detained because of the reporting that their son or their brother or sister um, uh, was doing for Radio Free Asia. Um, so it's, it's really um, amazing that they still, you know, feel so strongly about their mission um, and think that, you know, if they weren't to do it, that, um, you know, these stories wouldn't be told. Um, we, you know, we found the same with our, our reporters um, in, in Myanmar now. Um, you know, we actually offered them the, the option of, you know, cutting ties with RFA and, you know, giving them a severance. And um, if, if they felt like they, they just wanted to leave uh, and, and not be a journalist anymore, um, and they didn't take it. No one took it. Um, we we have journalists in hiding right now um, around the country. We have some that are waiting at the border um, who were working with the State Department on um, on uh, you know trying to get them to the states um, and uh, granting them humanitarian parole. Um, the State Department has been very helpful on that front. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know these authoritarian countries are finding. Um, more and more and, uh, you know, sort of sinister ways of, of targeting our reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy, do you see any more questions? I'm looking for raised hands if there, um, if there are any other questions. Um, well, if not for right now, I, I did have a, uh, another question, Bay. Um, I'm just wondering uh, and again, we talked a, a bit earlier about the turmoil that, that USAGM was going through. And, and now that there is a new administration and, and um, uh, things are starting to be restored um, uh, and to Radio Free Asia and with the other radios, have you noticed um, any increase in the support from, from Congress, for example? Uh, do you see that there might be additional support, budgetary support for Radio Free Asia and, uh, and for the other radios, but particularly Radio Free Asia since it's dealing with these very, very critical issues right now? Well, thank you for the question. Um, we would love to see more funding. We're, uh, um, we're definitely uh, underfunded when, when you compare us to um, our, uh, our, our uh, sort of sister organizations under USAGM. Um, and when you compare us obviously to, uh, to the Chinese and, and other 13 countries that are uh, throwing money um, at the issue. Um, we, um, yeah, we, we would love to uh, get more funding. We'd, we'd uh, um, one of the things that we'd like to do is to start um, uh, an investigative um, unit that can basically work with um, our different services and um, and really delve into some of the issues that that we're not able to now. So, for example, um, uh, we were uh, we were given a, um, from a source we were given um, a, a document called it's called the Aksu list. Now um, it was from a province in in Xinjiang called Aksu, um, and it had um, basically. 4,000 detainees and uh, it listed the reasons why they had been detained. Um, and we just didn't have the manpower to go into, you know, sort of the investigation that would have to be done uh, to, to look into, um, you know, what, what this really meant. And so we gave the list to Human Rights Watch. They sent, they spent, you know, months, um, uh, you know, basically uh, following um, different sources and, uh, and they came up with this great uh, report on uh, basically 
how the Chinese government was using big data to um, to to target uh, Uyghur individuals using such um, you know just examples of like you know people who had received calls from overseas or uh, people who had uh, you know read the Quran recently um, as, as reasons to detain them. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and and then I had to, I had one other question. Um, I, I know you mentioned it's very difficult to do polling um, in these in these countries, but I'm just wondering how do you get feedback? How do you find out um, what the people, what your audience members, um, how they're they're perceiving what you're reporting? If they find it um, accurate, if they um, if they want to continue to 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 get more um, news uh, from Radio Free Asia, um, are you able to get feedback? In other words, through through social media and uh, and other ways. Yeah, indeed, we uh, we get a lot of feedback through um, audience engagement on on social media, um, and uh, and that's that's been um, you know really helpful and and uh, you know definitely a development over over the last you know uh, decade or so. Um, uh, we um, yeah, uh, and, and especially our uh, the the you know why not um, digital brand um, that that we started last year um, that uh, there you know, very uh, active on social media and they're, um, you know, constantly getting uh, um, uh, comments and uh, reactions um, from, from people. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you know, one, uh, one uh, um, student from, from Qinghai University, uh, you know, posted something saying like, you know, um, you know, these are great sort of uh, uh, cultural uh, snapshots. It's like snacking on a culture snack is what he, he said. Um, you know, it's sort of like a, a different um, uh, way of, of, of getting information. Freda, we have another mm -hmm. question from Jim Kelman. Oh, okay, yes, Jim. Thank you, good to see everybody. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, Bay, for a very, um, enlightening and uh, round, round 360 degree uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. I would like to follow up a little bit on the question that I think Mary Wirtz asked about Korea, um, mm -hmm. given the South Korean law. Now, <clears throat> the South Korean law seems to be more directed at um, media that's being somehow smuggled into North Korea, mm -hmm. either floated in or, or actually infiltrated in and or possibly radio broadcasts that are being done along the border in China through uh, missionary groups has, and, and also I understand the law is pretty new and has not been um, in, um, enforced yet. Um, uh, has this or should this or will this affect the content of RFA broadcasting? No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, no, I mean, no political, to, to, yeah, to follow up on, on uh, your and the, the original question, um, uh, there's nothing in, uh, you know, when I said we, uh, you know, we definitely follow the political situation uh, um, in in countries in our region. Um, none of that would actually um, affect our uh, the content of what we broadcast. Um, it's just a question of whether we're able to transmit, um, uh, you know, from those countries. Um, uh, so uh, so it would make it a little more difficult if we were to, um, you know, have to shut down certain transmitters um, because of a, a political, um, uh, you know, um, either uh, influenced by, uh, by a country that doesn't want us reporting, um, uh, or, you know, if there's, um, you know, a, a, a sort of change in policy. Um, uh, like in South Korea, but I don't really want to go into the specifics of where our transmitters are either. <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah, I, I just had um, one last question. I know we're getting uh, close to our to our time, but um, I think you did mention that um, you you uh, have reached um, Uyghur populations, for example, in Turkey. And I'm just wondering if if um, RFA makes an effort 
to, um, to reach diaspora populations, because I'm sure that a lot of these people have um, tried to flee and spread to other um, countries. And I'm, I'm just wondering what efforts you're making to reach the, the diaspora. Yeah, I mean, so the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 for example, the why not uh, um, uh, brand is, it's all digital. Um, and so, you know, you can reach it, uh, you know, anywhere uh, there's a Mandarin speaking population. Um, and the idea behind it was, um, you know, was to basically uh, uh, counter China's um, influence uh, on, on Mandarin media um, uh, all over the world. Um, you know, it, it's been pretty remarkable. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I use my, my own parents as an example. They, they came uh, here in the 60s in the, to the US and uh, they've been watching Chinese media um, and consuming Chinese media, um, you know, for all of these decades. And it's only really in the last 10, dec 10 years or so that, um, you know, I've, I've seen that their views have, have uh, changed, become more uh, nationalistic. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, it's because, you know, in the past there was Hong Kong media, there was Taiwanese media, and a lot of that has been taken over by the CCP. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, um, it, so, so we we launched this, uh, you know, not only to reach you know Chinese students um, in in around the world, um, but you know people who might not know how the the Chinese um, have infiltrated media, um, uh, you know, so so uh, uh, rapidly and and completely. Yeah, yeah. Are your parents able to hear? Um, uh, RFA in the U.S. <laughs> uh, um, well, <laughs> they they may or may not have that interest. <laughs> so that that's a a family issue. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I see a question here. It says here, does um, embassy diplomatic assistance uh, or other help um, from the embassy? Um, in dealing with uh, its target countries? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we definitely do have to reach out to, um, to embassies uh, when we have emergencies, especially. So for example, um, uh, um, you know, dealing with our, with our uh, reporters in Myanmar, um, we, uh, um, you know, the issue is that many of these reporters who are in the countries uh, um, are not U.S. citizens. So, you know, for example, in Hong Kong, our our reporters are um, are from Hong Kong, um, and uh, and so it would be it, it's a bit uh, more you know trickier of a proposition for for the U.S. Um, consulate uh, to to help in that kind of case. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bay. This has really been. Um, just very um, enlightening and um, and inspiring. Really, the um, all the things that um, that uh, that RFA has been able to do, and I I'm not very good at doing the the um, uh, <laughs> the clap uh, um, uh, icon. But anyway, thank you. It's really it's really been wonderful, and and uh, hopefully in the future we'll we'll be able to have you back when we we're able to do things live um, in uh, um, at, uh, at DACOR. Uh, so that, um, that would be lovely rather than from my four-year-old's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we really, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very, very much. And, and uh, I don't know if you have any final words um, before before I turn this over to, uh, to Adam. No, just thank you for the opportunity. Okay, well, we're very pleased that you were able to do it. And now I'd like to, um, of course, thank again, um, uh, uh, Judy for your really, <laughs> your expert help with this and, and particularly uh, you're providing all this technical assistance without which there's no way that I could have done it. But um, anyway, I, now I would like to um, turn it over to, to Adam, who um, 
I, and I just want to say, because I think that the, for both Adam and uh, Judy, who are moving on to, uh, to other responsibilities, this is going to be the last one of these programs that they're going to be able to um, participate in. And it's just been such a great partnership and I'm going to miss both of you terribly. Hopefully you'll still attend some programs from, uh, <clears throat> from time to time, but it's been wonderful working with you and thank you so much. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to, to Adam to, um, uh, to say a few words and uh, also about um, our future programs. So Adam, over to you. Thank you for a fascinating program and um, uh, thanks to all of you for coming and thanks to all of you for a uh, fascinating, it's been I think 11 years since we began these monthly programs. Uh, and uh, so- uh, Is that long? It, wow. Yes. <laughs> so Judy and I, uh, we will be lurking uh, mm -hmm. and um, our colleague Nick Cull will be uh, the point person for USC in these partnerships and we look forward to uh, many more programs, um, including two next month, which we hope uh, you all can attend. Uh, our next program will be uh, the May, first Monday program on Monday, May 3rd, also at 12 noon Eastern time with John Maxwell Hamilton. He'll be discussing his book, Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda. And uh, many of us know him. Jack is a professor of journalism at Louisiana State, Louisiana State University. And he's also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, here in Washington, DC. Our mid-month program next uh, month will be on uh, May the 13th, also at 12 noon Eastern time, and it will be the PDAA awards program. Um, and so there will be uh, four presentations and uh, all of that of course will be live starting at 12 noon Eastern daylight time. So until Monday, May 3rd, uh, we're adjourned and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone for attending. Bye-bye.